Well, thank you guys. Uh, thank, I would like to thank Odie's on Facebook first off for having me tonight. Um, especially Alan and Susan Resnick. Thank you guys so much for setting this up. I really appreciate the opportunity. I hope everyone's staying safe during COVID-19. I'm Dr. Scott Mosco, Clinical Director of Roswell Eye Clinic. Uh, we're a six-doctor private practice. I practice with my parents, Billy and Sharon Mosco, my sister, Michelle, two other associates. Uh, this is our 41st year in practice. Um, so we do everything that optometrists can do in the state of Georgia, full scope. So of course, I'm talking on dry eye, so we treat a lot of dry eye. We also do a lot of scleral lenses, primary care, of course, a lot of disease. Um, I do have some disclosures. Uh, Bausch and Lowe, my lecture on the contact lens side of things. Tear care, um, which is a sight sciences product for treating my Bohmian gland dysfunction. I do some work for Perk and Essilor. Uh, also, I've contributed to Optometry Times, review of optometry, and optometric management. I also consult on billing and coding and practice management. So I figured a great place to start is, what is a comprehensive eye exam? A comprehensive eye exam is an evaluation of the complete visual system, whether it's vision insurance, whether it's medical insurance, whoever's paying, however much it is, a comprehensive eye exam, so a 92004 or a 92014 is an evaluation of the complete visual system. And when you go into a comprehensive or routine eye exam, the patients expect you to treat them the same way, whether it's vision insurance or medical insurance. So I would encourage you, if you treat a dry eye patient under medical insurance differently than a dry eye patient under vision insurance, um, to not do that. Treat them the same way. Now, I'm not saying to do anything for free. There's lots of ways where you can bill medical insurance appropriately. You can have them come back another day for their medical visit. You can do coordination of benefits where you collect their vision copay and their medical copay to do medical procedures on a vision exam. Um, but I am not saying to do anything for free. I'm also not saying to force a patient to be under medical insurance. Um, there's lots of talk about folks saying, oh, diabetic patients, we can force them to build medical. No, we can't. What I'm saying is, is don't just do preservative free artificial tears. Uh, if vision insurance is paying, treat them the same. Also, what's great about our cash pay mybomian gland procedures is you can bill that to the patient out of pocket on any day. So, optometrists without a doubt are the most equipped and the best trained to treat dry eye. But why is the average OD? ignoring dry eye and you guys on this are not the average od because you're watching a talk at eight o'clock on a wednesday night about dry eye so you're not the average od but the average od is ignoring dry eye and we know that because we got primary care doctors trying to take over the treatment of dry eye pas nurse practitioners dermatologists i hear all the time my dermatologist told me to do this for my dry eye so there's four reasons that I've come up with on why I think most optometrists, the average optometrist, I should say, is ignoring dry eye. One is patients don't bring it up to you unless you ask. So you have to figure out how are you going to ask about dry eye. Patients think that it's normal. All of my dry eye patients tell me that it's because of their allergies patients are not bringing up dry eye you have to find dry eye the second thing is is the low initial consequences of skipping or missing dry eye you're not going to have a lawsuit most likely because you miss dry eye it's not like a retinal detachment however there are significant consequences to not only your bottom line of your practice but also patient satisfaction if you're not treating these dry folks appropriately. 
Number three is it's not really the sexiest thing to talk about. We don't call up our old optometry school buddies and talk about how you got someone from an instant tear breakup time to seven seconds. Now, I would say dry eye is getting sexier with some of the new stuff we can do for dry eye. We've come from an area where we didn't have much for dry eye to now we have so much for dry eye, but it wasn't the sexiest thing or isn't the sexiest thing to treat. The fourth thing is some doctors out there say it just takes up too much chair time, especially at those routine exams. Maybe they'll just come back if it's bad enough. And I will tell you that it's probably taking up more chair time to not talk about it. And we need to talk about the difference between educating the patient about something versus making an excuse. And my definition of education is telling a patient something ahead of time. My definition of an excuse is telling that same thing to a patient when they're upset because you didn't tell them that ahead of time. And of course, we want to educate patients, no excuses, play like a champion. So I'm going to give you two examples. The first example is a patient that comes in under routine vision insurance. You ignore dry eye because they bring it up when you're walking out the door and you're already running behind. You say, you know what, use these artificial tears. And you also just prescribe this patient some new contact lenses. The patient comes back a week later for a free CLPE. I hate free CLPEs. And now you're having to do a dry eye workup for free because the patient's upset and they're under the impression this is under their contact lens eval. Let's rewind. Let's see how we could handle that patient differently. What we could do for the patient differently is when that patient complains about dry eye, put them on some sort of dry eye regimen that's better than just artificial tears, whether that's scrubs, hot compresses, omega-3 vitamins, some sort of treatment in office, just do something, see them back in a month and say, you know, when we see you back in a month, that's going to be under your medical insurance. And guess what? You're going to be wearing contact lenses that dry the eyes out. So you may notice a little bit of intermittent blur while you're wearing these until we get the dry eye under control. You see them back in a month, at that point in time, under medical insurance, and you handle their dry eye from there. They may tell you, you know, these contact lenses aren't working out as well as I'd like them to, but they're better than the first week before I treated my dry eye. So again, we wanna educate our patients on dry eye, pre-appoint them, not have to make excuses on why something that you sold or prescribed for the patient isn't working. So if we can agree that it's best for both the patient and the practice to proactively treat dry eye, how can we make this efficient? How can we diagnose dry eye efficiently? And how can we hold not only ourselves, but also our associate doctors accountable for making sure they don't blow off dry eye, especially when they're running behind? One thing that we do is the speed questionnaire. And I don't know about your staff, but my staff sometimes forgets to order supplies. So what we did is we got tired of running out of speed questionnaires. So we put that into our electronic health records as questions that are asked every single time before the patient is seen by the doctor for every single vis visit, regardless of who's paying. It's great because it develops medical necessity it also shows the patient that they are improving with time. They may not remember how bad they were. I've stolen a protocol from Dr. Resnick. If they score six or higher, we go ahead and do my bomian gland imaging as well because we know the patient's got some symptoms of dry eye. Two other questions that we ask in addition to the speed questionnaire I think are very, very important. One is, do you ever have to regularly blink to clear up your vision. And I love that question because the number one symptom of dry eye is intermittent blur, having to blink to clear up your vision. I tell my patients, it's like having a dirty windshield on your car. You gotta use your windshield wipers to clear things up. The second question that we ask, some people may be horrified by, but it's, do your eyes feel perfect? 
And I think doctors as a whole, we, what are we asking patients all the time? We're asking patients, are you getting better? And the patient says, yes, I'm better than I was before. We pat ourselves on the back and we say, great, I did my job. What we ask is, are you doing better? And then are you perfect? And until your eyes feel perfect, we continue to talk to you about additional dry eye treatments. Why? Because our patients don't know that there's something else that we can do. Now, when it comes to treating dry eye, we've talked about diagnosing dry eye. When it comes to treating dry eye, there's two ways we can treat dry eye. We can treat the symptoms, and we treat the symptoms by preservative-free artificial tears. We obviously don't want to use preservatives more than about four times a day. We only recommend preservative-free artificial tears. But that's treating a symptom, not the problem. I tell my patients, if we just give you tears, that's like giving you crutches. Imagine you had a broken leg and you went to the surgeon's office and you crutched into the surgeon's office and the surgeon said, well, I could do surgery on you, but you really seem like you're doing well on the crutches. Let's skip the surgery and let's just keep using those crutches. That's what preservative free artificial tears are. And for some people that are using it once or twice a day and that's perfect for them, maybe you don't have to do anything else. But for a lot of folks, we're just giving them crutches. We need to treat the underlying problem. And to treat the underlying problem, we have to find out what is the cause of the dry eye. And it's either evaporative, aqueous, or tear deficient, or a combination of both. And for a majority of my patients, a large majority of my patients, it's a combination of both. So let's talk about evaporative dry eye. And when I say evaporative dry eye, I'm referring to blepharitis, my bony and gland dysfunction. And of course, we know there's symptoms of that. We just got a my bony and gland uh, imaging instrument. Before that, we had an anterior segment camera. We used our ASEG camera to show our patients how their meibomian glands are clogged up. We find the meibomian gland imaging is way more powerful. We know a picture is worth a thousand words. This is what I'm seeing. Think of it like going to the dentist and getting x-rays of cavities that you don't even know that you have. It's very, very important for maybe the asymptomatic patient who has this meibomian gland imaging starting so you can show them that and talk to them how those glands will atrophy or die out with time. Why do they care? Because their eyes are gonna get dry if those glands atrophy with time, or maybe they're fine now, but if they decide to wear contact lenses later, it could be problematic. Something else that happened with clogged up meibomian glands are hordeolum and chalazion, of course. Now, a side note, if you can do injections in your state, please take the injections course. I do injections in Georgia. Um, it's, it's an awesome course. I love being able to add that to what I do in my state. Back to evaporative dry eye. So what do we start off with? We start off with scrubs, hot compresses, omega-3 vitamins. Now, how do we talk to patients about this efficiently? One, get a printout or make a printout, I should say, that talks about exactly how your office does dry eye. Also, we have about a two and a half minute video that we show our patients that explains how to do the eyelid scrubs, the omega-3 vitamins, hot compress mask, and tears as needed. That saves us a ton of time, especially the doctors. And before, we used to have our technicians go over that. And I find that the video leads to a lot more patient confidence in the treatment. They know that we've looked at the video, it's edited appropriately, you're not gonna be told anything incorrect, and of course it saves the doctor some chair time. We also have a pager system for all of our technicians. It's called Long Range Systems. You can direct message me about that if you want to. I have no ties to the company, but it works awesome. We've got a dry eye button. Our Technicians show up in the exam room with all the dry eye supplies. We also have other videos about visual fields, clear care, scleral lens care, CRT care and use, all that kind of good stuff. So back to evaporative dry eye. In addition to our over-the-counter treatments, we offer tear care. 
Tear care is a device that heats up the glands on the eyelids for 15 minutes. Then the physician goes in there and clears out those glands. Uh, we delegate that process to our technicians. They attach the device to the patient's eyelid. And then in about 14 minutes, the technician interrupts me. I'm normally with my next patient. I go clear the glands for five to seven minutes and then come back in. Of course, there's lipo flow that does not involve the doctor um, manually clearing out those glands. There's also Ilux, Mibo Thermo Flow, and Thermal One Touch. I can't really speak to those others because I do not have one in my office. Moving on to aqueous tear deficient dry eye, obviously that's when the lacrimal gland produces a low quality tear that has hyperosmolarity to it. You can detect that, of course, with tear lab. We do not have a tear lab. We treat that with Zydra, which takes about a month to kick in, Restasis, about three months to kick in. We haven't used Sequa yet. Uh, we tried to compound cyclosporin from a compounding pharmacy, but the patient could not tolerate that. So that didn't work out for patients that could not afford it. After we treat evaporative and aqueous deficient dry eye, uh, if the patient still doesn't say that their eyes feel perfect, we then go on to plugs usually. And we start off with a two-week dissolvable plug. We tell our patients, think of the eye kind of like a bathtub. By treating the evaporative and or aqueous tear deficient dry eye, we got a better bath water. Now we're going to put the drain plug in. We see them back about two weeks later because plugs have a 10-day global period. At that point in time, if the plugs helped them out, we either do a surface mount permanent plug or a six-month dissolvable plug. The standard of care is surface mount plugs. But if the patient declines surface mount plugs due to irritation or that they keep falling out, you can do six-month plugs um, every six months or every four or five months, however long it takes for those to dissolve. Something about plugs, um, in the CPT rules, it is, it's written that it, it is expected that all their treatments, including a trial period of artificial tears, proved unsuccessful in relieving the patient's symptoms before utilization of plugs. I'll read that again because you need to document this if you're doing plugs. You're going to get paid without documenting this, but you may fail an audit. You need to document that the patient uh, failed all other treatments, including artificial tears. When you do plugs, if you do one plug on the right eye, and or one plug on the left eye, you wanna use the RT modifier for the procedure on the right, LT for the procedure on the left. If you do two on the same eye or all four, you wanna use the E modifiers. Um, E1 is upper left, E2 is lower left, E3 is upper right, E4 is lower right. If you do plugs only, you cannot bill for an office visit, meaning a 9-9 or a 9-2 code. However, Lots of my dry eye patients also have glaucoma, and we know that the preservatives in glaucoma drops can make dry eye worse. So if you had a patient that came in with a chief complaint of glaucoma and their primary assessment is glaucoma, then you could use the 25 modifier on that office visit code, the 99 or the 92, to get paid for both the office visit as well as the punctal plugs. But remember, the chief complaint and the primary assessment can have nothing to do with punctal plugs. It needs to be an independent diagnosis. Typically after plugs, for those patients that wanna to continue to wear contact lenses, we do scleral lens contacts. Um, in our office, we do free contact lens demos. You put the lenses on, see what it's all about. If you wanna go with it, Absolute, uh, there is an evaluation fee. If you don't want to go with contact lenses, absolutely free. We started doing that with soft lenses. Now we do it with sclerals, especially for our dry eye folks, because we want to make sure, A, the patient can tolerate a scleral lens, uh, which most of them can, and B, um, it is expensive. So we want to put our money where our mouth is and show them what it's all about before asking for money. 
For more severe dry eye cases, we do do some amniotic membranes. They often require a PA. I'm in Georgia and Blue Cross and Blue Shield Anthem in Georgia really doesn't like paying for them. They also require them to be hydrated. So like a Procara, they won't reimburse for say a BioD, which is a dehydrated. Um, the diagnosis codes that are best to use are recurrent corneal erosions, which is not really a dry eye code. Um, never lie, but if the patient has an RCE, you can use that. Um, but you can try to get your prior authorization with KSICA, SBK, and of course, ulcers. Know that if you are going to use it on an infectious ulcer, you need to make sure that the ulcer is improving with antibiotics before you throw on an amniotic membrane. Ocular rosacea also falls into the dry eye category. Doxycycline, 50 milligrams, BID is what we use. There is, I think, a 20 milligram time release, but that's a little bit more expensive for the patient. Um, if we're going to keep the patient on doxy for more than a couple of months, I usually will loop dermatology in. Um, what's a dry eye talk without a good old uh, Demodex? Those are live mites that live on or near hair follicles in mammals. I have never seen a Demodex in the slit lamp because it's too small to see in the slit lamp. You have to use a microscope to see Demodex. What you need to look out for is cylindrical collarettes. That is pathognomonic for Demodex. So if you see collarettes, go ahead and put them on something that has tea tree oil in it. Um, that is the end of my official talk. I think I'm, um, I may have some questions here. Let's see. Please send in some questions if you have any. I'm happy to answer. Um, which brand Scalarals? Um, I use Zen RC, RC meaning regular cornea, if it's for the regular cornea. Um, a reminder, I do lecture for Bausch & Lohm, and Zen is owned by Bausch & Lohm. Um, any other questions here? Can we get a guest appearance from Billy Moscow on Scalarals? Um, no, but maybe on the next one, we'll have Billy Moscow do this. He's at a different house, uh, but Scott, I'll, I'll have him FaceTime you directly. How long on Doxy for? Um, usually, the question is, how long do I keep patients on Doxy for? Usually, one to two months. If it's pretty mild, one month. If it's more severe, two months. Um, but it, if it's over three, usually I'm saying, hey, let's talk to a dermatologist about this. Um, what is long range system? Is that the name of the company? Yes, long range systems is the name of the company. What they do, if you go to uh, like a big restaurant, they have all the buzzers at big restaurants, but they also do all of the pagers at a lot of hospitals. So it's called long range systems, not associated with optometry at all, um, but it's a really, really good product. We had a bunch of crummy pager systems um, until we found long range. It's working awesome. To treat Demodex, I'm not doing anything in office. Um, I am, I have certain tea tree oil companies that I like. Um, pick your favorite tea tree oil company, see them back in a week, see how things are going and have them do it at home. I know some people do it in office. I don't do a ton of that. So if you guys have better um, ideas on, on how to treat Demodex, please send a message and I will relay that to everybody. <laughs> Shiv, any preservative-free artificial tear is fine. Stick with those in Canada. Keep scrolling through. Uh, okay. I have tried, Paul, Jamie, and I have tried Ilux before. What I didn't like about Ilux is that you have to hold it on there, and I didn't like that it wasn't as long 
um, heating the eyelids themselves. Okay, what other questions do I have? Uh, Dr. Resnick says that prostaglandin analogs damage my, uh, the meibomian glands, not just the preservatives. Excellent point. So since we're treating primarily at first with prostaglandin analogs, those are damaging the meibomian glands in addition to the preservatives. Yes, we like to debride the eyelids before doing tear care or lipoflow. Um, and there may be some talk about having a debrider during the tear care procedure. I don't know if that's percent. Don't hold me to that. How do I handle the non-insurance covered management discussion? So you need to figure out who in your office is most comfortable asking for money for a procedure like tear care or lipoflow that could cost $500 to $1,000 out of pocket and have that patient handle the discussion. You don't want to say certain things like, but it's not covered by insurance or things like that. Here's the price. Let's say it's a thousand bucks. This is going to be a thousand dollar procedure. We have great results. It's not covered by insurance. Would you like to have it done today? That's how we handle the discussion. But it needs to be if your doctors are not comfortable having financial discussions, then have someone who is. People, you know, you probably have daily disposable contact lenses that are being sold out of your practice. If you have a technician that's comfortable asking for 750 bucks to a thousand bucks for dailies, they should be able to have a conversation about uh, an out of pocket expense. I would have the doctor go over the medical necessity and benefits of the procedure, but then have your technician go over the pricing. Um, so my wife shaves my head every night. I'm not allowed to shave my head because I miss too many spots. She does a good job though. It's a little long. long. Um, Shiv Sharma asked um, thoughts on implementing uh, IPL. I don't know the laws in Georgia. Um, last time I checked, it was not legal in Georgia or it wasn't specifically legal in Georgia, Not maybe not illegal, but I would love to do IPL. I think that's uh, especially great for um, rosacea. What else you guys got? Well, thank you guys so much for your time this evening. Um, I want to end with just a little advice during Corona. Think about something that you wanted to do, but you couldn't do it in your practice because you were so busy seeing patients. So while I've been slow, I've been trying to figure out all of those items and try to knock as many out as I can. So just try to figure out something again that you were just too busy seeing patients um, and knock that out. Uh, oh, other question. The question is, do you automatically initiate treatment for patients you put on prostaglandin analogs? No. Are, are you talking about a device or are you talking about um, an over-the-counter treatment? The answer for either of those is no, but it probably would be a good idea to preemptively go over our over-the-counter treatments for those patients that we put on prostaglandin analogs. Uh, I have not used CEQA. I may be saying that wrong. 
has it, has anyone else been using that and can share their experiences? If you send me a message, I will share with everybody. Um, I'm curious to know. I know it's got a little bit higher concentration of cyclosporin. So I want to know, does that make it work a little bit better or uh, are there more side effects? Let me confirm. Yeah. Tequa is 0.09% cyclosporin. Restasis is 0.05%. Um, back to the question about, do I automatically start a dry eye treatment or my booming gland treatment for patients analogs? No, I don't, but I, I don't even start supplements necessarily, but I do like the idea of doing that. Well, thank you guys. Have a great night.